Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of the Ben Werman podcast. Today, I have joining me a very established gentleman in the carnivore space. His name is James Lehman, also known as the Carnivorist on Instagram. And I did see you are on Twitter as well, or X, whatever we want to call it. So look up the underscore Carnivorist. He has an extremely awesome story. I'm super happy to get into it. James, thank you for coming, my friend. Ben, the honor and the privilege is all mine, my friend. So looking forward to this conversation today. Thanks for having me on, brother. Absolutely. So we love long, rambling, long-winded stories here. Very safe space for that. Give me the whole spiel. And I know that like so many other people, myself included, your story or your, your diet and health story really started in childhood. So could you bring us back to the 70s and 80s and walk us through this adventure you've been on from plant-based diets and meat-based diets and all the lessons you've learned along the way? Oh, sure, man. And uh, for your listeners, please bear with me. It's, the story is a good one, and it ends out, as you can tell, by my countenance today in a positive way. But I'll go back to the beginning, as I like to say, when the earth was cooling. At 51 <laughs> years old now, I can't believe it when I say it, Ben. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. I feel great, though. I feel great. So yeah, I was, I'm coming to you today and was born and raised in the beautiful island of Bermuda. Uh, so yeah, tough place to be from. I know it, listeners. I know it. Um, beautiful outside today. Ben and I were just commenting on it, how what a gorgeous day it is for us. And I am a child of the 70s. I was born in 1972. Uh, my dad is Canadian. My mom is Bermudian. And uh, that's how I ended up on the beautiful island. And of course, listeners, as you I'm sure are aware from Ben's prior guests and all his knowledge that that time in the 70s was particularly interesting because that was when the U.S. dietary guidelines started to switch and the low fat movement came out and high carb diet of the 70s and 80s. So I grew up, my mom was vegetarian from the time I can remember and still continues to be this day vegetarian. She does eat some eggs and she does eat some cheese, but has not had any meat products, beef or chicken since I can remember and I was born. My dad has eaten meat his whole life. Um, so in my household, I noticed because I would go to my grandmother's house and she would be cooking the traditionally old way with the good old butter and fats and save all the roast beef fat and all those delicious things. So I would love to go to her house on a Sunday, man, for a meal. At home, I could th see things in the fridge which were, I can't believe it's not butter and margarine and all these skim milks and you know, Ben, don't get me wrong, listeners, I am not blaming my parents because this was the pervasive narrative that was coming out because this would help with heart disease, with, with, this would help with longevity. You have to remember, that, again, those U.S. dietary guidelines impacted us even all the way here in Bermuda because all the schools started, you know, cutting out the whole milk and putting in skim milk for us when we were in high school. And I sort of lived that way for many years. I ended up going away to boarding school, and that was at age 14, and I ended up going to boarding school in Canada, and I was a chunky, overweight kid. I got teased a lot when I was in, in school, leaving Bermuda, and I think, not I think, I know that was a product because I ate a lot of sweets, a lot of carbohydrates, um, and just was chunky, and no, no ifs, ands about it, and didn't exercise as I probably should. That kind of all changed when I went to, uh, to high school in Canada. Um, of course, when you go to a boarding school, you have to abide by what they give you. So you better eat what's put in front of you or you're not going to eat. And as it turns out, the chef at our boarding school was Hungarian. So there was a lot of meat and stews, especially in the winter time, because it was cold up in Canada. I just remember the cold. My first time seeing snow, Ben, when I was 15. Boy, was that a shocker, my brother. That was unbelievable. No snow in Bermuda, I'm assuming. <laughs> no, sir. No frost, no snow. So no that skiing, was, mountains. No, <laughs> water skiing, but not snow skiing. Yeah. So I once I started, and you know, looking back now, I was eating a lot of meat during that time because it was quick. It was easy. It was in high school. And then I started to get into sports. And what the listeners will notice is this sort of happened again on my dietary journey, where what I was eating sort of made me feel better, and then I would get into exercise. So put that pin in there, and we'll come back to it. And I lost a ton of weight. I was on varsity basketball, varsity crew, and doing really well. On an Ontario scholar, my brain was clicking. So again, pin in that. We'll come back to that later. 
and ended up going to university in Canada as well. Did my university career there. At the time, I began dating a young lady uh, that was a vegetarian. Now, Ben, you have to understand this was the early 90s. There wasn't a ton of stuff out there then, so it was pretty admirable that she did that. And by the way, I ran into her sister recently, and she continues to be a vegetarian, so more power to her. Um, and she ended up becoming a veterinarian, so that shows sort of her disposition in that regard. And as one does when you're young and in love, you're trying to switch up your dietary eating to make things easier at home, especially as a student, because we're not going to go buying separate meals. Well, I'll just eat what you're cooking or you can eat what I'm cooking. And I switched over to a more vegetarian diet. Long story short, ended my university career, um, was no longer with a young lady, but continued to eat in that vein. And I think I'll just have one slight segue backwards. And that was I ended up twice getting salmonella poisoning because I dabbled once or twice in having some meat way back then. And I ended up getting salmonella poisoning. So I said, right, I'm taking that out. It was awful. Went to two restaurants, ironically, and got uh, from chicken and said, I'm not going to touch any more of the meat anymore, but I'll continue to eat eggs. I'll, I'll continue to have dairy. Came back to Bermuda, got in the working world, high stress environment. I was in insurance for many, many years and long hours convenient food, got back on the processed food train, still continue to be vegetarian. I'd add some local fish in when I could, but primarily vegetarian for the most part. So think just eggs and dairy. So from about 1995 or so, I hadn't really touched any meat products at all. And I did not, no beef, no chicken, no turkey, right up until my most recent journey back into adding animal foods in my diet. So along that way, while I had returned and was in the working world, again, I became more sedentary. I didn't exercise. Processed foods went up. Drinking alcohol went up because it was a high stress job. And my health declined for sure. And th at this juncture, I was in my 30s and, and going into my 40s. And my health was not the best. I had a, had a couple of episodes where I had passed out and just literally fainted. And I should have looked at what I was eating, but of course, the modern medical establishment wanted to pin it on something else, not diet. Obviously genetic, you know. You got it. Yeah. You Nothing got to it. do with any of the things that you're literally shoving into your face, giving you nutrition, can't be that. Yeah. And I was having sort of aches and pains and just attributed to being in my late 30s, early 40s. I then met my wife and she saw what I was eating. And this was, now I've fast forwarded a little bit here, Ben. So please, listeners, bear with me. I fast forwarded a little bit. 2014, saw what I was eating, obviously questioned what I was eating at the time and said, okay, well, let's look at what you're eating and why you're eating it. And right about this time, the infamous game changers, forks over knives, Dominion, all the vegan propaganda, that movement was really starting to get an upswell. And I came across it and I said, well, I've heard about this vegan diet. You know, I'm already pretty much there. I'm vegetarian slash pescatarian from time to time. Why don't we take a look at what that brings to the table, all puns intended. And I mean, those films, Ben, I'm sure you've spoken to guests, they are pretty dramatic and pretty compelling. And for the both of us at the time, we said, right, okay, we want to do better for our health. Like I clearly needed to do it. I had been drinking too much. My health was not the best for being a, a now about 40 year old plus. So let's eliminate and see how we do. And we did. And we wanted to do better for the planet. And the, the scenes of the animal abuse were very compelling. So I thought, all right, this has got to be the way. Everything that I looked online was, you need to go vegan. This is going to be the best thing for your health. And I, I tell you, Ben, and I tell the listeners that for the first little while, I did feel better, significantly better. And a lot of people are shocked, but no, I, I, I've myself spoken with many ex-vegans who, when they first switched over to veganism, that this is the case. And in fact, just yesterday on my walk, and we can talk about how I incorporate exercise into my routine now, but I go on a weighted walk most every other day and then gym the other days, I ran into a gentleman who had seen me online, ironically, 
and was asking me about it because he said, well, I don't understand because I've just recently gone vegan. And I went, he said, but I'm feeling great. I said, <laughs> well, that's probably, and this is where I'll tie it back to your listeners because I started eliminating a lot of the processed foods. And then there's also that bias because you then start to want to do better for your health and adding exercise back in. Right, Ben? So yep. I the health, to... healthy user bias, I think they call it. Yep. You got it. And the, the people that follow the guidelines to a T are the ones that also do all the other things like exercise and, you know, get more sun and do these healthy things. And the people who say, fuck the guidelines are the ones that like go eat meat. So they're going to have these people that already are doing other unhealthy things kind of lumped in with the meat eating group and the people who want to be healthy with the vegan group. And it really just muddies the waters of like, what is actually the best diet specifically? Do you think I explained that decently? <laughs> it did a tremendous job yeah. and that was awesome. And for the most part, we ate very, very cleanly, like really fresh, local, seasonal fruits, vegetables, organic grains when I could, beans, legumes, the whole nine yards. Now, were there some processed stuff in there? For sure. I mean, it's very difficult to avoid on a vegan diet and plant-based diet. I mean, there are those that do the whole raw thing. I even experimented with that for a while, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for the first little while, just eliminating all that processed garbage that you think I've been eating a lot of chips, a lot of meals out, French fries, maybe some small bit of protein on the side, eggs when I can get them. Um, I thought for a while a lot of my issues were because of gluten. Um, they had tested me for a gluten allergy, and so I was eating gluten-free. And so a lot of the gluten-free stuff is a lot of high nut stuff. So I'll tie back into that too in my knowledge now. Oxalate, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, big time. So I was building my oxalate for many years. And then going into the high oxalate vegetables really compounded it. But I felt great for a while. I really did. And in fact, I was started preaching online, not being pushy, but just extolling the virtues of the diet, trying to show at the time that this had been helpful to me. About three or four years in, things took a little bit of a turn. And I should have noticed then that they weren't quite right. But, you know, looking back, I was just thinking, oh, it's got to be age because now you think I'm creeping into my mid 40s now. Aches and pains started cropping up. I just remember I started to forget things. My brain wasn't quite clicking and the brain fog started to creep in. My digestion wasn't quite right. Um, I was either loose stools or constipation and alternating between. And I started to lose weight, whereas before I maintained, but I started to lose weight quite rapidly and to the point where people were asking me, well, you look pretty thin, James. Is everything okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, everything's okay. I'm eating really clean. Again, my blood work was pretty good. I, I went to get it checked at that time, and it was pretty good. And my doctor was saying to me, oh, James, you're on the vegan diet. That's the best thing for you. Don't worry. You'll be good. Your, your LDL is low, so that's a good thing. And, uh, and I just wasn't feeling sharp. And my work started to suffer. My athletic performance started to suffer. And also, my home life started to suffer. So it impacted me mentally as well. And this continued for a couple of years. It just got worse and I could not figure it out. And everywhere I went on all the chat boards to do with veganism, it was because I wasn't doing it hard enough. I wasn't veganing hard enough. I needed to go harder. You need to get all that stuff out and go juicing and raw. So that's what I did. I said, okay, well, I want to feel better again. And that really sent my health into a really bad downward spiral. And I'll pause for a second there, Ben, in case you have any questions as I've rambled on long enough for your listeners. I'll throw one in there before we continue. This is one that just popped up in my head because, as I told you before we started recording, I've talked to Teresa O recently, mm -hmm. and her vegan experience was that she gained a bunch of weight and got very puffy and bloated and like her weight. She she lost control of her weight in the upward direction. Mm -hmm. And for you, it was in the downward direction. And this is definitely consistent with what I've seen in my own life. I've been surrounded by vegans my whole life and plant-based eaters. I grew up in Seattle, spent the last six years traveling, bouncing around hostels. Both of those places are hotbeds of eating lots of plants and people believing that this is the best way to eat. So I've seen that consistently. It seems like there's a divergence 
vegans either become very bony and frail or they just get very puffy and gain lots of weight. So what's the deal with that divergence there? How, what decides which way, which of these shitty outcomes you have if you eat plants? Wow. I'm not entirely sure other than I think it has a lot to do with the types of food you are eating. Now, obviously, mm. if you know you're, you're juicing and going that route, I see a lot of those folks online that definitely lose weight as I did. And mm -hmm. then there's the flip side. There's the sort of processed food vegans who eat a lot of yeah. the seed oil laden burgers. I mean, I ate my fair share too, but as I say, it was predominantly fresh foods, fresh vegetables. And I think it has to do with that. And also one's, I hate to say it, but gut microbiome status as you go into the vegan diet. What I hadn't mm -hmm. mentioned, and I should mention at this juncture is that during my vegetarian and pescatarian years, I took a ton of antibiotics because as I mentioned, I wasn't feeling well. And I went to the doctor, oh, you're fine. You know, pass it off, not dietary related. Maybe you have a little bit of a stomach infection. Let's just throw antibiotics again your way. I remember late nineties, early two thousands, antibiotics will fix it. But it was, it just destroyed my gut. I was on ciproflaxin more times than I can count and long periods of them. And it was because I felt I had this gut infection um, and men, we're men here. Uh, my testes were in pain constantly. Like it felt like someone was had a vice on them and they couldn't figure it out. They thought maybe it was epididymitis, which is a, a symptom where you get a bacterial infection in your testes and it swells them. They confirmed it once, but it kept reoccurring, reoccurring. My theory is now looking back is that had a lot to do with oxalates being dumped out through my urinary tract and my poor kidneys working overtime and the pain that I had. Anyhow, hindsight is 2020, as they say, brother. Um, and not to mention all the supplements you're taking too, because like you had the antibiot antibiotics you're taking quite often. And when you're vegan, you have to take supplements. Even the vegans know this. You have to have this shelf full of these pills just to be able to basically function. And you were doing that too, right? Oh, absolutely. When I first went into the vegan diet, I mean, I was quite adamant about reading what I should take alongside it because I knew I had heard, especially the B12 route. And of course, I went and found the best vegan B12 that I could find in the, <laughs> paid a lot of money for it too. And then also vegan D3 took that as well, <laughs> which looking back now makes me smile, Ben. Um, and then plant-based protein powders to make sure I was getting all the best plant-based protein. But the real hilarious one is the plant-based collagen. Now, if there is ever a lie in a title for food, plant-based collagen. Yeah, but I took it all. And yet I, my health still went off the cliff. So yeah, I, as I mentioned, I started to have these challenges and they started to exacerbate. And this is where things really start to ramp up for me. So the year was 2019. I was losing weight quite quickly, even though I was still going to the gym, still stuffing my mouth with food and thinking I was doing the best thing for my health. I noticed at my job, the brain fog was creeping into the point that I was forgetting things that I was supposed to be doing. I'd literally be typing on the keyboard and I'd forget why I was, why I was there. What am I, where am I? What am I doing? Also, the IBS was really getting bad now to the point where I either had complete diarrhea symptoms, or I wasn't going to the bathroom for two weeks at a time. And it was painful, bloating. And then I started to notice my nails started to crack, my skin was getting really dry, and my hair was falling out. And more over than, the, uh, over than that, you know, I attributed a bit to age that my libido left me, like literally gone. And all those things combined are enough to give you some anxiety. But my anxiety went from here to here. And it was so bad that I was no fun to be around with all these things going on. And then I became depressed because I really thought I was getting early onset Alzheimer's. The, the IBS had turned into blood in my stool. I was dropping weight almost like in the region of five pounds a week at one point. So listeners have to understand from my journey, as I mentioned to you from the beginning, I was always a pretty chunky kid. I'm six foot about one or two now. And at my heaviest, I was in the 200s at my sort of steady weight in those vegetarian pescatarian years. I was about 190, 195, close to 200 sometimes if I overate for a year. I then started going down and thinking, okay, well, 170 is normal. That's pretty good. My waist was thin. At my sickest, and this is where we really get into the nitty gritty, is in that 2019 years, uh, uh, year, excuse me, 
I got down to 127 pounds at six foot two and a 28 inch waist and not able to use the bathroom at all, no matter how much I was putting in my mouth. And then I started getting blood in my stools, scared the bejesus out of me. People would see me in the grocery store, Ben, and go, are you okay, man? Are you dying? And I'm like, oh, I'm okay. And lying to myself, right? No, I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm eating healthy. I just uh, got something going on, lying to myself and lying to them. I ended up having to fly away to the United States and get a CT scan done on my abdomen because uh, at that time I was traveling for Christmas, but it just, I got so sick. I got so sick. I remember being on the plane and thinking I was dying. Came off the plane, went straight into emergency in Virginia, and they ran a CT sc uh, scan with contrast on my abdomen to check I didn't have a mask growing in there. Thank goodness I didn't. But then had a stool sample done and I had uh, Shigella bacteria in there. Who knows how that got there? I'm, I'm thinking some sort of vegetable that I didn't wash properly. <laughs> and um, I also, figured out that I had chronic Epstein-Barr virus. So that was replicating in my system nonstop. I had thyroid issues. My, my thyroid went from hypo and then swung back to hyper. Skin getting worse, nails getting worse, very drawn, very gaunt. I couldn't do much. Year is 2020. We all know what happened 2020. Came back to Bermuda after Christmas and, and had to be um, put on disability from my job because I was unable to do the daily duties of my work. COVID hit. Of course, I had already been down disability, and as it went along, they ended up making me redundant because I was not really in sight and not really, in an honest moment, I wouldn't have been able to work. So 2020 was my lowest, lost my job, basically almost bed bound, 127 pounds, bleeding from my bowels, hair falling out, skin cracking, nails cracking, depressed, anxious, unable to sleep more than a couple hours a night. Yeah, not good, Ben. <laughs> not good. And I'll leave it there for you, Ray. <laughs> Yeah, 2020 it was, it's so funny how you hear so many stories of 2020 being like the do or die year for people in so many different ways. <laughs> yeah. It really just, people just for the first time in a while had the time to stop and think like, what am I going to do next? And we'll get to that in a moment. But one of the, the points I wanted to drop in was how you went and got your stomach checked and mm -hmm. you were thinking like you were worried there could be a mass. I'm assuming you mean like cancer, right? And my first thought is, you are correct in being thankful and lucky for that because as you and I now know, all these fruits and vegetables that people are eating are just breaking down into sugar in their body, which is cancerous fuel. So this is why, like, this is such an important message to get out because you and I are now on a carnivore diet, which has, you know, no sugar, no carbs. And we are, we're taking in no fuel for cancer. So I basically am able to throw that out the window. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But people that eat lots of carbs and sugar, they're, they're on a path down to that potentially in the future. And it's really hard to say this early, like how much it increases the risk. But I would say it's a crazy risk to take. Why would you? I mean, obviously something has changed in the world in the last century where cancer used to not even be a thing at all back when humans only ate meat. And now it's skyrocketing when everyone's eating plants. So am I crazy? Or is there maybe some connection there, James? No, 100%. And you're absolutely on point, Ben. I mean, we've both listened to, I'm sure, the work of Dr. Thomas Seafried, And he Legends. is doing tremendous work. I hope to get him on my podcast soon. I don't know if you've had him yet already. I'm gonna beat you. Oh, good, man. You should. I'll be <laughs> any any time I can get a fellow carnivore aficionado having these type of guests, man. I say more power to you, brother. Um, we now know, or from his studies, and thank you, Doctor Seafree, that cancer primarily thrives on glutamine and glucose. And you're absolutely right. I think the advent of these high carbohydrate seed oil, as well, being in the recent history of, of our past dietary choices, that's a huge one. And then just the increase of these plants and they convert over, especially the fruit side. I mean, Ben hinted at it earlier. They not only do they have anti-nutrients, but some of these have an excess of glucose in them. And especially if you were like me and at the end stages there, I was juicing like a demon. I had found the medical medium. I know, Ben, I know. I followed his advice. Then I found this other doctor that said that she had uh, cured her lupus with these three day, uh, three a day smoothie recipe. And these smoothies had them. And this was then when I got to my worst, literally at my, I felt like I was literally, I wouldn't live the week. So I threw kale, spinach, 
almond milk, a cup of chia seeds in there, turmeric, blended this thing up and chugged it down three times a day for my meals because it was going to detox me. I was going to rid myself of all the toxins that I had accumulated from eating the evil meat over the years before. And uh, it nearly killed me. It really did. So I had the highest oxalate foods, highest bioavailable oxalate foods, and then was still throwing in a ton of these high glucose sugar laden fruits and sweeteners on top of it between these smoothies. So craziness. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And the examples of, I mean, on the subject of fruit, I think that that's especially one to drill on because it's just so much sugar in, in modern fruit. And, and this is, I keep, keep hammering this to people. Modern fruit is a man-made creation. It's not natural. The way that you walk through the grocery store, everything is vibrant and colorful and gigantic and super sweet to taste. That is not the way that fruit really was in nature. If you go back even just a few hundred years ago, let alone thousands of years ago, none of those things were edible <laughs> in nature. We human beings have gone through thousands of years of like very selective farming to just get them sweeter and sweeter and more tasty so they can sell more. But it doesn't mean it's good for you. It's, it's the exact opposite. Like you can see extreme examples like Steve Jobs. He was a fruititarian, died of cancer. I mean, I know that that's only one example, but that was a very high profile one. And I know that Ashton Kutcher, I believe, was like, you know, in he was, I think, auditioning for a movie to be Steve Jobs. So he was wanting to be in character. He did it too. He did tons of fruit and he had like major pancreas problems. Our bodies are not meant to digest this stuff. It's just, it's, it's not good for us. No. And it, no matter how many, we've all been told that it's good for us our whole life. We've all been there. We all grew up in the school lunchroom with, you know, the pictures of the dancing fruit characters. Like they're, oh, eat more of us. We're so good for you. And the TV commercials. And I was even in a gym yesterday getting like laying back on his massage chair in, in Mexico, by the way, this is global. I'm, I'm getting my massage, looking at the TV and it's, there's like a diet uh section on a tv talking about how, oh like after the gym here's all these great things you can eat it's like lettuce and tomatoes and you know a bunch of mangoes and it's just all fruit and vegetables they don't they completely ignore meat and it's it's, it's crazy it's it's a wild rabbit hole indeed <laughs> it once you start going down this rabbit hole and we discussed why and you have as well and i did too your eyes, the red pill carnivore moments that you have and realize why we have been pushed this way of eating. I just made a post that I had done with Jane Buxton, author of The Great Plant-Based Con, on who and why is pushing this plant-based agenda. And when you start pulling these threads and your eyes get opened, and we talked about Nina Teichholz and her fantastic book, Great Fat Surprise. If you haven't done that, listeners, make sure you read that book. It's... It's pretty astounding, but uh, yeah, all all very, very interesting to say the least. Absolutely. And I think that's a good time to transition back to your story. So wh where were we? You are now in the depths of veganism, having a terrible time in 2020 at your lowest weight ever, looking for answers. What do you find? So yeah, again, listeners, lost my insurance, health insurance. Remember, we're in lockdown. I had severe bleeding from my bowels, but my local GP thought I had had colitis because once we confirmed it was definitely, thank goodness again, that it was not a mass or anything like that. You also have to know that Shigella can cause, uh, the bacterial infection I had can cause bleeding too from that area. But she was convinced I had uh, colitis, which I believe I did too, because I was just cramming myself full of fiber, highly undigestible, which I believe now know for the human body, this stuff like just cramming and cramming. And it's sawdust. It's completely indigestible, people. Fiber really. sucks. <laughs> you it's... don't want to eat fiber. <laughs> oh, I, I, sh I shudder now, Ben, when I think. I shudder. And I was looking for a way out. Um, literally, you have to understand, I thought I might be clocking out of this life at any point coming up, I was in so much pain. I had so much fibromyalgia, so much brain fog. My eyesight was starting to fail me. I couldn't see. I mean, I know I wear glasses, but it was the point I couldn't, my prescription was not even working. I couldn't see right here. Um, and I was depressed and anxious. So it was suggested to me, well, why don't you listen to some podcasts? You have nothing else to do. Just put the earphones on and just try and search. So I did. 
And of course, initially I started looking at, you know, vegan stuff, <laughs> but then something clicked in me. I'm like, James, what's going on here? Think about it. Just think about it for a second. And I never forget this day, Ben. I typed into my iPad at the time. I had an iPad and I said, can plants harm you in any way, harm a human or something like that? And I came across Sally Norton's presentation, Lost Seasonality on the Overconsumption of Plants. And I told her in person and I cried with her in person and thanked her because she literally, I, th I really believe she helped me save my life. And I watched that presentation. It's still up on YouTube. Lost seasonality and the overconsumption of plants that she did, I think, in 2016 or 15, I want to say. And that forever changed my outlook because when I understood that plants have these chemicals that protect themselves, they have things like oxalates and phytates and lectins, as Ben was talking about, they can't run away. So, of course, there's got to have some protection there. What I didn't realize is I had been, as you heard before, firing myself for years with the highest volume possible. Like when I tell the story to these experts in the oxalate area, like Sally and Monique Attinger, they're like, Jesus, James, <laughs> we're surprised you're still with us too. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's, it was scary, man. So I, I listened to that and that caused me to unravel this thread we've been talking about. Okay. So if that's that, maybe I should consider adding some animal foods back in. And I did, but first, Again, because the cognitive dissonance in the vegan diet is very real. It was very difficult for me. I thought, well, let me, before I go back this life-changing route, let me lower my oxalate foods at the beginning. So that's what I chose to do. I said, okay, well, Sally's telling me about there are some low oxalate options on vegetable side. So I started doing that. I felt a little better for the first four weeks, but it really wasn't moving the needle. <laughs> I have to be honest. I felt a little better, like uh, maybe I could get out of bed and go brush my teeth whereas I couldn't before but I will throw this out there love Sally K Norton to death she's a legend but she's very diplomatic <laughs> sometimes I like people that just push us a little harder like just just stop eating vegetables it's easier trust me <laughs> yeah and I learned that for me and we're going to talk about this a bit Ben is that listen listeners I'm here today to tell you my journey my end of one experiment on myself and how it profoundly changed my life. And you can hear how it did. You know, I get very emotional talking about this because I, I don't take it lightly when I say that I don't know that I would be around and how depressed and how anxious I was. You see me here smiling and laughing with men today. This was not James four short years ago. This was not me even closely. I've put on 50 pounds of mostly muscle since that time. So that shows you how many are different physically and mentally because of these experiments I did on myself. And Ben's absolutely right. It was that pushing that little bit extra. And it's not for everyone. I understand that. And because of the high oxalate amount that I had in my body over, you know, and they accumulate in your body, I knew that moreover than just changing from the vegetables, I needed to add animal foods back in. So I chose to do that. And yes, it was very difficult for me having been strict. And when I tell you strict, I did not cheat for almost six years. Not at all. Not at all. It was very important to me. But what choice did I have? It was I, I wanted to live. When the, the will to live is strong, and I just said, James, you got to do this. So I first started with salmon, which was most known to me prior to jumping into full veganism because I had had some fish and I really enjoy salmon, whether it was in a sashimi style or cooked salmon. So I did salmon first and that first, that first bite was a tough one, but man, I kid you not after that first piece of salmon, Ben, I, I did struggle getting it down. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how people that switch from the vegan diet, going back into eating meat can meet some challenges digestively when they start, but. And I mentally kid, too. Like, and mentally. Even bigger, I would say like just the aversions to like, you're so convinced that this is like evil to eat what you're supposed to eat as a human being, like as a carnivore. It, yeah. It's it's crazy how that's that works. Yeah, absolutely. And, but I kid you not, after a few hours, it literally felt, and you hear so many ex vegans tell this story, but I kid you not, I felt like the light switch went click. And that brain fog just started to go from down here was, and then just it started coming up. I said, oh man, here we go. And of course me being like you, Ben, I'm like, well, I got to find out more about this. 
And then because I had searched for Sally Norton on podcasts after that, because I said, I'm going to listen to everyone that she's got at the time. And I did. And I found uh, Scott from who then was the carnivore cast, but he's now the Scott My show. And I, I found Dr. Baker shortly after that on Rogan, as many carnivores had and have. And I listened to him and I'm like, this guy's making a whole ton of sense here. Just like Sally had. This is this is making a lot of sense. Like I had been nutrient deficient on bioavailable nutrition for so long. So I had the crazy combination of toxicities and malnutrition. And if you speak to Dr. Anthony Chavey, that's where he believes the modern uh, diet has failed us and where disease comes about. A combination of excess uh, toxicities and lack of nutrition or malnutrition. And I certainly had that in spades. And I had realized that I'm like, okay, here we go. You got the fish down. It's time to really start incorporating some real meat back in. And then I went to chicken, <laughs> which is starting with laugh. baby steps. I see. <laughs> yeah. Chicken. Um, because um, listeners, I had found, I had was going to a nutritionist. I was going to a nutritionist to help me along the journey. And I don't give this nutritionist nearly enough credit when I speak. I've spoke once about her before. I spoke to her when I first was a vegan and was very sick. She was the one that ran the stool samples on me and saw my weight and how depleted I was. And she said, James, I have to be honest with you. I don't really work with vegans. And I looked and I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I don't. Because unless you're willing to add some animal products back in and i'm looking at you now james at 100 and at that point i think was 30 pounds <laughs> and i literally passed out after giving blood in their office and she was very nervous she was gonna thought she was gonna have to call an ambulance because i literally keeled over again she said no something's got to give here james she said i'm not going to work with you if you don't add some animal foods back in your diet and i left i'm like well i'm not going to do that because there's no way this is the best diet i know what i'm doing i'll find somebody else the dunning kruger effect is real and it, it sure is but that little seed, all in puns intended, was planted in my head. And I, I think back right now about that. And I think and, and have to say thank you to her at that time. And she always extolled at the time, oh, you need to add some chicken back in. You know, even she was talking about red meat's kind of bad for you. So I suggest some chicken, um, skinless chicken breast. So that's the sort of the first things that I did. And also because, and now we can tie it into what I would say, when you have been vegan as long as I have had, your digestion suffers, especially with what the listeners have heard about what I was bombing my gut with. So I had been on antibiotics, a poster child for getting oxalate toxic, because when you're on antibiotics, it destroys your gut microbiome, opens up those gut junctions. So those crystals literally can start entering in and ripping your guts to pieces and then get in your bloodstream, cause the calcium oxalate stones. And real, and, real quick, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I don't remember if we, I don't think we specifically like define oxalates, but these are just plant defense chemicals. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you've researched this more than me. It's one of many defense chemicals plants have to deter predators from eating them. And this particular kind it just turns into a literal blade, like a crystallized blade inside your digestive system. And it just rips you apart from the inside. And this is why so many, you know, vegans just deal with like pain. And it even goes on to like the brain fog and it just causes havoc. It just destroys everything in your body. Like, is that pretty accurate? Would you say? hundred um, percent. Plants use them for a variety of reasons. Again, vegans think of plants as these benign things that can affect us, that they're not living. These, these plants are smart suckers, man. They know what to do to defend themselves. And they also know how to use these oxalate crystals for many benefits for them. They actually sequester, pull calcium out of the soil using these crystals. So go figure, goes in the human body, it's going to bind up with calcium and magnesium. That's why so many vegans become nutrient deficient, especially in calcium bone loss, because they're bombing themselves with this. They also defend their seeds, their progeny, their babies. So you think nuts and seeds, especially super high oxalate. I mean, you listen to, I was bombing chia seeds are one of the worst, my God. And not only that, but they become so gummy and sticky and then like sandpaper going through, like you said, Ben. So yeah, these, these plants are not defenseless and they are not, they are not our friends. And as Dr. Bill Schindler says, they should scare the heck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and, Including uh, the ones at the store that are in that pretty packaged bag with like, you know, the, the vitamins written on it because and this is a crazy thing for me to see now as I walk around the store with this new knowledge is that, 
yes, some of them may have a little bit of these vitamins on paper, but one, they're not bioavailable. You talked about that earlier. The human body is not designed to break these things down. We're not a ruminant like a cow who can. And two, it has all these defense chemicals you're bombarding yourself with. So on neither side is it worth it for you to take these far inferior uh, nutrient vehicles when you can just eat a piece of meat that has all of them, more every single vitamin you need in bioavailable form. And it doesn't give you all these problems from the defense chemicals. It's it's really a no-brainer when you just put them side by side. And and this is why I, I just lose my mind at the like the well balanced diet people, like they eat the rainbow, like everything in moderation. Like why would you partially include poison in your diet when you can just only eat the good one? Like I only eat red meat and I've never felt better. I've done this for months. I know you've done it for a while. It's so much better for your health to do that. And this is just mind blowing for people. I know, but when you really break the foods down, there is no reason to eat plants whatsoever, fruits or vegetables or grains or nuts or legumes or seeds or any of those things that we've been told forever are good for us. They have nothing that meat doesn't have. You don't need them. Amen, brother. I could have said it better myself. And, you know, ironically, as we move on in my journey a little bit further now, I, and, and I will, I'll tie it back into, just let me wrap up that last point on the digestive issues. Being a vegan for so long, you lose your ability to produce stomach acid. So talking to Lier Keith, who's the author of The Vegetarian Myth, she, she is now on betaine HCL, which is a supplement you have to take to supplement your hydrochloric acid in your stomach. I'm on that continually to this day still too. Because if you're not putting that stuff in your, there, the stomach doesn't have to work as hard to break down the protein and the meat to make it more bioavailable for us. So many vegans suffer from low stomach acid and also enzyme insufficiency from the pancreas and also gallbladder issues too, which I have as well. I had cysts in my gallbladder, which can be out from oxalate too. All these things just start to add up for me when I went down these rabbit holes, Ben, and I still supplement with some enzymes and betain HCL to this day with my steaks. But that initial phase of adding the meat back in was very tough on my digestive tract because I didn't have the proper bodily functions from not eating meat for so long. So this can be a problem for ex-vegans as they first transition. So for those that are thinking they're doing it or in the throes of doing it now, make sure that you have enough, number one, stomach acid. And there's a simple test you can do online that you can do at home to do that. And one's a baking soda test. And then also that you have sufficient bile. If you like me, I had sludgy bile because think of the way the body works. Everything's supposed to work in concert. So you eat the meat, it starts digesting in your stomach acid, then goes through your, your gallbladder, then secretes bile as it enters into your small intestine to help further break it down and emulsify the fats and take out the fat soluble vitamins to give you the nutrients you need. But if you've been vegan for a while and your body hasn't been producing it, you've got sludgy bile, which I definitely had. They confirmed it via an ultrasound. I had cysts. I have cysts in my gallbladder, which can be from calcium oxalate stones from too many, too many plants and fruits and vegetables. And I definitely have low stomach acid, which I proved by that baking soda. And then just you, you basically pop a bunch of pills and figure out until you get discomfort. At my highest, I was up at like seven or 10 pills at every meal. I'm down to two now, which is because your stomach begins producing acid again. But once I got over that, and once I made the switch to red meat, man, Ben, as you say, all the lights came back on, all the chronic fatigue that I had, all the aches and pains started to alleviate. Interestingly enough, the bigness, biggest dissonance I had after, you know, even adding animal foods back, as I said, like the will to live is big was completely moving all the, removing all the vegetables from my plate. That was the hardest. So I kept some low oxalate vegetables for quite some time on my plate. But then I was like, yep, I'm going to go full bore into this baby. Here we go. And I entered what I call the honeymoon period where you just couldn't stop me. It's when I started my Instagram account. I've been doing for this for two plus years now. And I started my podcast because of it, because I just want to tell people, man, I just literally came back from the brink of death. I'm 50 plus years old now, but in my four, late 40s at the time. And I wanted to let the world know what had happened to me on this crazy dietary journey. So that's where I, that's where we are now. And please, I'll pause again so you can ask some more questions. That's just amazing, man. And it's, I just know as you do, there are so many people out there dealing with those problems that don't know that there is a very simple solution. And it really just gets you riled up to go out and just blare the megahorn, not the megaphone, and 
I, I first heard you on Sean Baker's podcast, as you mentioned. So you've been making the rounds, like making this, you know, big focus of your life, which I think is so awesome. So kudos to you for that. I really I'm, can't imagine how many people have, you know, changed their ways listening to your story or at least planted a seed and moved the move the needle for them a little bit to think about it more because for a lot of people it takes a lot of touch points and a lot of testimonials they've heard of people they can relate to and that will really resonate with them and also the power of podcasts as you mentioned how it literally was just listening to some podcasts that completely changed the trajectory of your life and that is something i'm so big on because it's it's crazy to me that some people just avoid podcasts or starting, you know, their own YouTube channel or whatever it may be to tell their story, even if they have a good story to tell, because they just think like, oh, there's like too many people are doing it. It's too saturated. Like I won't make a difference, but you never know who will hear your story and it could change their life. And it's so powerful to just decentralize the distribution of information because I, I really do believe we're in, a hefty information war right now there's all kinds of different rabbit holes to go down regarding like you mentioned the the money behind those plant movies like the game changers what the health cowspiracy all of these these are all funded by big money interest behind the scenes like the game changers director james i think he's a director or producer or whatever james cameron um he, like or oh, like partial owner of pea, a pea protein company, like this fake meat distributor. Um, and the the new one, the Stanford experiment, whatever it's called. I talked to Nina Teicholz about that. The creators of that are literally uh, completely owned by Beyond Meat. So like every one of these has some fake food money behind it, just trying to like push these things. And of course... To, to get people moved in that direction, they don't just come out and sell it directly and say, you should buy this fake meat. They weave this huge emotional story about like, you know, this is why real meat is bad and real food is terrible. And they, you know, they spend months or years trying to find the most disgusting, terrible footage they can of like, you know, a farmer kicking a cow or, you know, killing an animal in a terrible, brutal way in factory farming, which I'm sure we can both agree is not good, but they go, they really go to the extreme of just making sure that that is your image of the entire industry of farming, not just like a small piece of farming, but all of it. So to just really get people disgusted with the idea of eating animal protein as our bodies are designed to do. And you, you, when you talk to a lion, if he feels bad about eating meat, they're, they're going to laugh at you, of course, because that's what they're designed to eat. They have a certain stomach pH that breaks down meat perfectly. They don't eat salad and they just live their life as a piece of nature. And human beings need to be part of nature, too. We are animals. We are in nature. We should eat what we're supposed to eat. We shouldn't feel bad about it. We should embrace it and, of course, really push these ideas like regenerative agriculture and farmers who give their animals the best, most awesome, healthy, happy lives. And there are ways to make this a really excellent upgrade in our just reconnection with the world around us. And I think that forcing people or at least coercing them into eating plants, which are clearly not good for our bodies as people who've done enough research know it's, it doesn't nobody wins you're you're not doing anyone any favors or any animals any favors by eating a species inappropriate diet of fiber and fructose and fruits vegetables and grains oh by the way that kills way more animals from the monocropping so <laughs> there's no reason to man again so well said ben and you know looking back on my time as a vegan uh, and when i was at uh, ketocon hack your health this coming year, Dr. Barry was talking to me, literally in, in the forum, I raised my hand if he asked if there was any ex-vegans and I sheepishly put my hands up and he went, aha, and I singled me out in the crowd and uh, started asking me questions. And he said, you know, and I agree with him. He said, you know, I have respect for vegans because they're making decisions for their health based on what they put in their mouth. So I'll start right there. He said, I also know that eventually I've got them. 
just like I've got you now. <laughs> he said, because when those deficiencies creep in and when you really start to unravel the truth behind the messaging, he said, inevitably, I know you're going to come across to the other side. And he said, welcome back, brother. And I was like, thank you, Dr. Barry. But, you know, looking back on my time again, listeners, I was never really a pushy vegan. I was very impressed about how I felt afterwards, told people about it. This, as Ben so succinctly talked about, this whole podcast journey for me, and I do have my own podcast, we can talk about it, Carnivorous Chats, and it was just a way for, to let people share their healing stories like Ben is with me today. And it's so powerful, I think, these anecdotal and of one, you know, testimonies like myself and others, but they're just that. If you can resonate with even one part of that story, I've had people reach out to me, Ben, and I'm sure the same with you. They're like... James, I heard you on Dr. Baker. You were the one that convinced me to add animal foods back in my diet. I was so sick. I can't thank you enough. I've got messages by the bucket load on Instagram and even messages on my YouTube videos where people are saying, James, thank God about oxalates. Thank God I found your conversation with Sally and Monique. So it really comes back full circle. And I'm, I'm so thankful to be able to do this and to be able to share the awareness. And we all sort of fundamentally, like you said, that we want the same things. No one's an advocate for factory farming. Nobody. I don't, I don't like that. I think if we could combine our efforts into sort of dwindling that down, that would be great. But when you look at the benefits, I had Will Harris from White Oak Pastures on my podcast. Oh, the awesome. benefits, yeah, from, from regenerative agriculture, raising them properly, allowing the cows to do what they do naturally, contributing to soil health, contributing to biodiversity, doing what he did at White Oak, and then looking at how ancestrally we ate we talked about Dr. Bill Schindler. I'm having him on for the second time coming up. Eat Like a Human, his fabulous book. We did not grow and grow our brains back in the day as herbivores. We did not. It was not until we added animal products and began scavenging and then hunting that our brains developed and we became the humans we are today. And I'll leave on this note, you exactly said, or leave this part of the conversation on this note, is that you exactly said, we do not have the digestive tract that mimics and is able to the hindgut, the fermenting hindgut, like a gorilla, like they, they always say, look at the gorilla, the vegans, look at the muscles he had. Yeah, it has. Yeah, he also has this hindgut and then sometimes has to eat his own feces because he's short on B12. <laughs> no, no. We are omnivorous or even if we want to be excel, as Dr. Chafee says, we are carnivores. I would you know, say we're I carnivores that can handle other things better than most creatures can. But if you want to be optimal, carnivore. Yes. Yes. Completely agree. And again, listeners, I am not here to tell you what to do and put in your own mouth. However, I say this all the time. You heard me say it a lot on this podcast. Experiment. What have you got to lose? If, you're, if your diet is not serving you and you're feeling kind of like, eh, make some changes. Make some changes. Lower your oxalate vegetable intake. Like I did it first. Who knows? Maybe you'll see some benefit. Increase your animal protein intake and lower those fruits and vegetables on the side of your plate to where protein takes the biggest portion. I guarantee you're going to feel some benefits then. But please, for God's sake, don't do anything. Don't just listen to what's being bleated at you ad nauseum by the government. Well, I think we've learned enough over the past few years to know that we can't exactly trust what they're putting out. So do it for yourself. Read these books that Ben and I talk about. And, and I'm reading right now, I told Ben, I'm reading Dr. Georgia Ead's Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind book. And it is unbelievable. What a great book. And I hope to have her on the podcast too, like I'm sure you do, Ben. And just question everything. As our mutual friend, Courtney Luna says, eat meat and question everything. <laughs> That's the way to do Words it, isn't it? to live by. And yes, the sir. meat will help you question more things because your brain will work better as you oh. learned. Like, and this, is the, the, this has been my path as well. I, I didn't have the, the depths that you had in you know, like mental hardship, but I could sense a very, very sizable shift in just the amount of focus and mental clarity and drive and ambition that I had. Like, all, you know, I, I kind of wish I would have taken blood tests of like just my testosterone in general, because that is so much higher. And you talked about libido before, sure, absolutely changed. All, all of these things have just increased substantially since I cut out all the plants. I've, I've felt just so like go, go, go every day. Like I'm bouncing out of bed to get work done and just so excited to produce things and be alive and create new content. And this is such a common thread. So everyone that goes carnivore goes through this, and yeah. which is why we just 
are constantly yelling on the internet, like, you got to try this, guys. Please just, just give it a shot. Do some research. Watch Anthony Chafee's Plants Are Trying to Kill You video. That was like, he was my Sally Norton. Dr. Chafee is a legend. Yeah. I just started at episode one. I, I wish I remember who recommended him to me. I can't remember where I originally found him. Maybe it was just organic. I'm not sure. But the Plant Free MD podcast, episode one, I just listened to every single episode of that. And it's imp- like it is impossible to do that and not be convinced by this guy. <laughs> He's so smart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I found him, too, shortly after I found Dr. Baker, which is... Uh, I, I, same thing his how to how to carnivore series and plants are trying to kill you series god bless him and god bless dr baker for putting mm. the information out that they are now and it's it's so true thank thank goodness for all the people in this space now that are going against the narrative because the narrative is still strong i mean we talked about the reasons why it's out there i, I just posted a clip from my interview with jane buxton we talked about great plant-based con author and we can tie this all back to some degree to the Seventh Day Adventist Church and John Harvey Kellogg and Ellen G. White and all that fun stuff. And then corporations now are jumping it on because they saw marketing potential. So you have all those do- dollars. Then you have big food, and then you have big pharma. You the red pill vegan, uh, red pill excuse me carnivore, and then what we talk about is the carnivore zen mentally because you become so focused and absorbing so much more information that you can't help but just go wow what else have I been duped on? And this is still a journey for both of us, even more so for you because you have more you know years of plants to detox from, and you you talked a bit about the oxalate dumping you experienced so. I'd love to hear a little about that because I'm sure people who are now starting to think about oxalates, hearing this word pop up and maybe making the jump, starting to move more into a meat-based diet, this would probably be good for them to be prepared for because this is something that a lot of a lot of people don't know about when they cut out the plants in cold turkey. They sometimes don't have, or they sometimes experience weird symptoms afterward, which I've, I've actually seen my, my friend that I jumped into carnivore with back last September when we both started, he had this crazy shedding of skin, like dead skin on his body. Like it just like came out of his chest. He just hit me up like, Ben, c- come look at my bed real quick. And so I walked up there. There's like all this dark, like dirt looking stuff in his bed. And he was like, this just came off of my body. And, and so he's a total rabbit hole diver like me. So he's been deep in the, the videos and Sally Norton videos. And by the end of the day, he's like, holy shit, this is oxalate dumping. My body is, I I finally stopped filling it with these plants. So now my body has shifted into getting rid of the poison. And sometimes weird shit happens, like shedding a bunch of skin, like you're a snake or something. (laughs) And sometimes people have little crystals that come out of like their eyes and their mouth. And because like we said, these are literally crystals that are crystallizing your body and are causing these issues. So Walk us through what you experience and like what maybe some other common experiences are that people see, because I know you probably talked to people that have been through that as well. Excellent question, Ben. I'm so glad you raised it because it reminded me that I really wanted to touch on this, especially if you're like me and there is our, excuse me, and being highly oxalate toxic because the listeners have heard of all the plants and the highest volume ones that I consumed over the years. And it's the reason why I literally at my worst had to wear braces on my arms my hands were like this i remember laying in bed i would have these wrist braces on i talked about the fibromyalgia the knee pain the bladder pain testicular pain all because of oxalates so what the body does is if you're consuming oxalates in a small amount it can handle them and your kidneys think of kidney stones that is essentially is what an, an oxalate stone calcium oxalate is a kidney stone so you don't want those, but in normal amounts, your body can handle them. If you have good digestion, you have a good microbiome, haven't taken antibiotics as I did for years. However, if you start going and it's very, very easy to go over the amount that Sally talks about that can really start to accumulate on you, which is about a couple of hundred milligrams. And I mean, one couple of teaspoons of spinach and you see people pounding these spinach smoothies as I did. They, we're talking about the region of thousands of milligrams of oxalate a day your body begins to sequester this oxalate, store it in tissues, in the fascia, in your bone, goes to where high calcium areas, and the thyroid, so your thyroid can be affected by it. 
And it's basically trying to save you from yourself. It's going, okay, if we dump this right now, this guy is going to, or girl, whoever it is, is going to get either super calcium uh, oxalate kidney stones or potentially die because these objects are so far, far into the body, they're storing them in areas that they can work on later when you should choose to reduce the amount, which is why so many people tend to in the evenings or during the nighttime dump, but they don't know it's dumping at the time because when you wake up the next morning and your urine is cloudy, you can't see it clearly. That's a big sign. And I'll talk about some more signs in a second. So I, of course, like you heard me say, I was like, I feel like a million bucks on this carnivore diet. I am clearing everything's gone. And for the first three months, man, I was a superhuman. You could not stop me. The energy was coming back up. I was exercising again, putting on muscle, working out. I was like, yeah. Then about three months in, Ben, I was like, holy moly, what is going on? It hit me like a ton of bricks. I reached out to Sally online. I was like, what's happening, Sally? Have you dealt with people that are carnivore before that have had high oxalate backgrounds? She said, absolutely. What are you doing? What are you eating? I'm like, nothing. What was it that happened exactly? So the pain started to come back. The brain fog started to creep in. The abdominal pain started to come in. So I was like, the body was going, all right, cowboy, you've stopped. We're going to start moving this stuff out now. Thank you. And if you move it out too quickly, you can be in in a world of hurt. So again, Sally, God bless her wisdom. was like, you need to add a couple of low oxalate things back in your diet for a while to slow this process. It's counterintuitive, I know. And I was like, what? You mean I got to eat certain things again? She's like, unfortunately, yes, you do. Because if you don't, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So I chose blueberries. I still include them to this day, not every day, but most days. And they're low to medium ox fruit. And they're also a little bit of a carb source in the evening. But other than that, I don't consume any plants, no vegetables. I haven't touched a vegetable in four years or three years or something like that. But I do include those. They're sort of low glycemic too. And they help tremendously. There's other things you can utilize like dark chocolate, very high oxalate. Take a square of dark chocolate if you feel the dumping symptoms coming on. Uh, Tea, black tea. You can really steep the tea for a long time. Very high oxalate. That's one thing she recommends. But yeah, if you go too low, too fast, too quickly, you can exacerbate your symptoms if the body decides to start moving these things out that has been stored for years. So if you're like me and I've had a, a bit in a vegan background of very high oxalate foods, you may have to do that. Not everyone does, Ben, as I'm sure you've you sailed through pretty well. I mean, you go through the transitional fat adaptation stuff, normal stuff where you have loose stools for a while. But for me and for ex-vegans, the transition into carnivore can take a little longer in terms of the gut symptoms to go because you're dumping that way. Other things with dumping you have to look out for, the pain comes back a little bit. Um, tartar behind the teeth, big sign. A lot of carnivores get that early on. They don't realize that that excess tartar that you get build up is actually oxalate, calcium coming out through your teeth. As you mentioned, crystals in the eyes, the grit when you wake up in the morning, what people call it sleep when we were kids. Um, The cloudy urine, that's a big one. Burning urine when it burns sometimes to pee, that can be oxalate coming out. I had a little bit of that one actually. That was one of the few that I did have during that transition period. I could burn a little bit. I was like, that's weird. I haven't had sex in a while, so nothing to worry about there. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I I know exactly when my when I'm in dumping symptoms. I'll I'll give the listeners an example. This is a good this is a good point to talk about this. So I now know when dumping is about to start for me. I get this lower back pain and shoulder pain that comes on. Right now, I'm great. I've I've clearly gone through it, but it comes on and my muscles just get tight. I can feel my kidneys starting to work, and it hurts. Like it, it's painful, man. I'm like, yeah, but now I know what it is. So I'll, you know, maybe increase my oxalate and take a little bit more during those days. People tend to dump, ironically, around a full moon. Who knows what the lunar cycle is? But no that's kidding. Bit, yeah. It's actually, oh, interesting. <laughs> Sally's done research on it. So she talked to me and I was like, Sally, why am I not sleeping well and, and really feeling shitty, excuse my language, during a full moon? And she's like, well, I've done a lot of research and people tend to around, especially the full moons, dump harder. That's fascinating. It is. It's fascinating. And wow. sure enough, I can time for me, as I mentioned, I get this lower back pain. Then a couple of days later after the full moon cycle, then I get my urine gets really foamy, foamy urine and cloudy, like not clear. As she said in my podcast, like Lake Tahoe, you can't see to the bottom. You get very cloudy urine. Occasionally I get burning, but now I know what it is. And before I was like, like you, I was like, what the hell, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And then I wake up and my 
eyes are all gritty, almost like glued shut. And I've talked to a bunch of people that have even more severe dumping systems symptoms. So you got to be very careful and just go about it measuredly for a while. I mean, Sally will tell you she's in her ninth year and is pretty much clear. But she, like me, Sally was almost wheelchair bound with what she did to herself with oxalates for a while. So it can take longer. Just do your research. Um, I'm sure Ben may have some uh, great episodes on Oxlade. I have a ton for listeners. If they don't want to go to my podcast um, with Monique Adinger, I have a series with her where we went from the beginning of Oxlade and we're four episodes in now where I'm continuing to do a series on Oxlade. So it's very helpful about dumping and what to do and how Oxlade can cause histamine intolerance and other things. It spins off. So yeah, yeah. Something to look out for, for sure, Ben. It's a super interesting subtopic and one of those things that really kind of helps people put, you know, just find answers to what they're dealing with because it causes so many problems in so many places. And this is one of those things that does affect everyone differently, which, um, like I said, like my friend had very intense dumping symptoms. I had just like little small ones that popped up here and there because I was eating more meat for a while before that. I went through like, I don't know, maybe six to eight months of only meat and fruit before that. So my body was like nice and transitioned. I feel like a way that people can think of this, if, you know, de depending on where they are in their, in their diet, if they've been vegan for years or decades, I, I would say, think of this as like a, either ripping the bandaid off or a smooth transition, you know, like I'm sure if you want to go all in, I've heard tons of people do that and they just tank their way through the side effects of the oxalate dumping. And for some people, they want to do that. Other people, it's too intense. And like they, they have these negative effects and they want to just kind of implement a little bit more meat at a time and just like increase that percentage over time and decrease the plants. So it's a little bit of a smoother ride for your body. Um, I've been listening to Professor Bart Kay a lot and he really recommends that. To, you know, just move, move your way, like Think of your plate as a clock and just decrease those vegetables and fruit over time until it's all meat. If you want like a nice smooth ride or if you're like me, just go all in and just say like, forget plants. I'm done with them. <laughs> just <laughs> deal with the occasional weird effects that do like oddly sometimes pop up just months away, like months down the line. Bodies are crazy. Um, yeah. And as you mentioned, your friend was peeling skin and there's people develop rashes as they're oxalate dumping. People have it coming out. Sally in her presentation at KetoCon had pictures of crystals coming out of people's skin, out of their eyes, like huge literal crystals coming mm -hmm. out. It's like no crazy. wonder they were in so much pain. Like no, these were in their body. <laughs> no kidding. And you know, Ben, it just allows me to say one thing here is that more men need to talk about this, brother. Yeah. And I, I don't want to generalize, but primarily all the people that I've talked to about oxalates are women. And I understand because women tend to gravitate more towards the plant-based vegan way of eating, eating more vegetables. Red meat has especially been vilified for females. You know, oh, if women don't eat meat. Now we know that real women do. Um, and we just need to have more men in this space talking about what happened to them and sharing and giving examples because it's just so needed. So I appreciate you for, for bringing up your own and your friend's experience on it. I, I totally agree on that. And there, like, there, it's so funny. There's certain things that each gender kind of shies away from. And like, for one thing, like, I mean, both sides tend to shy away from the libido aspect and like the sexual health aspect, because that's just seen as sort of this taboo thing. But a lot of people are dealing with problems in that area and they don't really want to admit to themselves that, you know, that, that it's an issue. And this is one of the reasons why I think carnivore is so good because I personally felt a huge difference. You said you did. Um, and I was like in my 20s, like I wasn't doing terrible, but I saw an improvement. I was like, well, shit, like, of course, this is great. Let's look. <laughs> More people need to try this and see what happens because it's just going to make, I mean, everyone wants a higher libido and higher sexual function. That is like the foundation of your health as a human. Like, and, and this is another crazy story that maybe you can speak on this that vegan women specifically are told is that when they lose their period from not eating animal protein, it's a good thing. Like as if their body, it, that's wild to me because your body is literally telling you, you can't take care of yourself. So you're definitely not going to bring a human into the world. So it's shutting processes down to like survive. And that's very common among vegans is that they 
like start losing their period or they have very painful periods or just go through like horrific cycles or, you know, lack of cycle. And, and they're just convinced so hard that veganism is right that they don't really see a problem with that. Or it, it's, I mean, have you talked to people that have been through similar experiences like that? Because that's crazy how deep that goes. Absolutely. I've talked to quite a few women who had that happen to them and were told the same thing. I mean, when you look at the lies we tell ourselves, right? I, I just, I just think back to my health and, you know, I appreciate you saying, you know, we need to share. And I mentioned already in this podcast, my libido left me. It tanked on the vegan diet. My sperm count also completely went off a cliff. And the reason I know that was because I had myself tested because at the time trying to get pregnant and I am not able to father children or wasn't able at that time because my sperm count was so low and um, I do not have any children now. And now at 52, I'm probably a little bit late in my life, but that's okay. But we need to talk about these things. We need to share that experience so people understand and they're not going, well, it just must be me that this is happening to because I hear so many great things about this diet. It just, it's just got to be me, something biologically wrong with me. No, no animal fats, protein, et cetera, are the building blocks of hormones in our body. The moment that I started to eat the animal products, again, we've heard people talk about that they had their first erection, men, when they added animal products after being vegan. My libido came roaring back and I'm in my late 40s, early 50s now, like roaring back. And again, I know it's N of one evidence, but when you start compounding all these other testimonies from people online, you know that there's got to be some factual basis behind this stuff. Just do your investigation. Don't listen to as Ben just said, yeah, that, that's got to be a good thing that you've lost your period, ladies. That is not a good thing at certain ages. So and you're, you're absolutely right, Ben. It's your body telling you like, yeah, we're not going to bring another human in the world because you are not physically able to handle that right now. So excellent point again. Yeah, I mean, anyone listening to this who's dealt with anything sort of in that cloud of sexual function, that is your body's biggest messenger of where your health is at because it it needs you to be healthy in order to reproduce. Like we're just animals after all. All animals basically we live to eat, fuck, and reproduce. That's kind of our baseline functions. So if one of those is completely thrown out the window by your body, it's a huge like blaring alarm that you should look into fixing that. And you are not broken if you're having a problem with one of those things. You're you just need to get to the bottom of it and not trust any of the garbage you read online for the most part, because it's going to lead you in stupid directions. The very first thing that I would recommend, I'm sure James would recommend too, is to give the carnivore diet a 90 day try. Just cut out the plants that are full of these defense chemicals causing all sorts of problems. Just have fatty red meat, meat get, you know, ground beef with the fattiest you can throw some butter and eggs and bacon in there if you want to. Um, it's it's changing people's lives everywhere we look. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Because I've never once heard a story of someone going carnivore for a serious period of time and not feeling better, which is wild. Because everything you hear on the internet is that this sounds crazy. But when you actually listen to people, I, I, I've tried to find people giving bad testimonials so I can understand and try to figure out what happened. But it doesn't exist. <laughs> Literally, I haven't not found one. Not only that, Ben, but you don't hear folks like myself who were vegans and then went carnivore and then flipping back ever. There's never. just yep. never out there. When you mm -hmm. feel and experience the feeling of feeling how great the difference is, you just can't. You cannot deny it. I cannot deny it. I never thought for a million years I'd feel like I was back in my 30s at 51, like late 20, even better than then. Because at that time I was in a high stress job and eating a bunch of crap. So even better than then. So yeah, the, the testimonials are, are too powerful to ignore. And I agree with you 100%. Give it a shot for 90 days. What's the harm in 90 days? As I said to you, if you don't notice any benefit, sure, go back. And if your diet's serving you, who am I to tell you what to put in your mouth? But I guarantee you pretty much that you're going to feel something. Whether it's cognitive, mental benefits, physical benefits. Absolutely. 100%. And if 90 days sounds daunting, sure, you can do 30, but just understand that, like we talked about earlier, there are some transitional side effects, like the, as your gut microbiome is healing and regaining those, you know, the, 
I, I, I can't get too science. I kind of forget the terminology, but basically your gut's not used to producing that bile like it used to, or as, at least as much as it needs to eat meat. So there can be diarrhea to start out. I dealt with that myself. And sometimes people get constipation. Like it's kind of like a, they just get weird poops for a little bit. It's temporary. <laughs> and so if you don't, if you only do a month, you might not get the full enlightenment period. I would say you're definitely not going to get the full enlightenment period because once you get over those transitional periods and get more to the 90 day mark, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to give 0% chance you're going back after that because you're just going to keep getting better and better. <laughs> and I base that on, I, I've listened to hundreds of podcasts on this. Just, I've been obsessed as we both have. It's, it's truly universal. And one of the, the points I didn't want to bring up here was how we've talked about a few things now where everyone has a little bit different experiences, like the oxalate dumping, different people have different symptoms from that. Um, however, something I hear quite often on the interwebs, and I'm sure you've heard too, is everyone is different. So that means some people are better with plants and some people are better with meat. What do you think about this argument? The vegans sometimes throw out there like, oh, it's just, you know, I'm better with plants. You're good at meat. I'm good at plants. We're different. Do you think we're different? Are humans different? As Dr. Chafee says, we're from the human race. So therefore, we should be eating meat. And I tend to agree. Now, I did get a nuanced question, which I thought and ties into this, Ben, this morning from someone on Instagram that said, you know, I've she started uh, eating a carnivore diet for diabetes and, has, and she's type one diabetic. And has seen tremendous benefit in it and has been able to, she's still on insulin, of course, because type one is a real tough bugger to try and try and put in remission. It's almost impossible, but she's been able to lower her meds and feel so much better on the carnivore diet. But prior to that, she was vegan for many years and juice spinach smoothies as well. So she was saying to me on the oxalate side, do you think people are better able to handle oxalates? Cause she's never experienced any dumping. She says, James, how come I've never experienced where others suffer so much? And there is, and you, you, you tied it in nicely because of people's gut states, I think, as well, whether they can handle plants or, I shouldn't say plants, but they can handle certain amounts of meat, let's say, better than others. So again, think of my poor digestive tract and years of abuse. So I struggled for a longer time, my transitionary period to be able to absorb all the meat, which by the way, listeners, my digestion has never been better. Since I've been born, I can't remember. I mean, yeah, I pooped a lot as a vegan and yeah, way too much. And it, many times it was painful. And at the end, it, I, as I, you heard, I was constipated or severe diarrhea and it was just awful. I have perfect now. I don't need to overshare, but these are the things that are changing in me and have changed that are just like, now I'm like clockwork. Click, click every morning. Okay, beautiful. My body's going, thank you. We got bioavailable nutrition, very little wastage. We're using all the nutrients they're giving to us. Here you go. No pain, ease, done. So in terms of, you know, getting back to your point, I, I think, as like I said, Dr. Chafee said, we're from the human race. We are, oh, I don't know if I, I would agree. Would you say, Ben, that you feel that we're obligate carnivores? Yes. D yes. I, I fall into the Chafee camp. I, I, I'm with him on that one. I think that, like I said earlier, we're carnivores that have a little bit more tolerance for going outside of that than most animals, but it's still a negative. Correct. And again, if you look at how we ate ancestrally, I believe, and I think it's been proven by various people like Dr. Bill Schindler and other folks, um, Mickey Bendor, that mm, yeah, we, awesome. pri we prioritized protein, animal protein. And yes, when times were lean and ice ages, maybe we incorporated some plants in there because we had to, but we're going to mm. go after the animal foods first of all. And yeah, uh, there's some benign, not benign, but less toxic plant varietal, uh, varietals out there that we uh, probably came across. But then there's also ones that we took a bite of and killed, killed us. I mean, you yeah. think of wild hemlock, Dr. Chafee talks about it all the time. A couple of bites of that sucker and you're gone, man. I mean, the plants are trying to kill you. So yeah, yeah, there, there might be some small nuance, but no, I firmly believe we are designed to eat and consume animal protein primarily. And another thing that Chafee brings up whenever this comes up, which I love, is name one other species where different animals within that species have different optimal diets. It does not exist. There is a single optimal diet for every single animal. They're not eating like these. 
these quote unquote well balanced diets of like having a little bit of berries, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like they, they eat one thing and they eat it for their whole life, and they don't complain about it. <laughs> yeah. They they don't get cancer or yeah. you know gut pain. Like they just eat the thing they're supposed to eat their whole life, and it's their fuel. And yeah. this is a big mindset shift for me because so many people out there, I'm sure it's hard for them. We haven't even talked about this. Like getting rid of plants sometimes is hard because sometimes they taste delicious. Like I, of course I, I, I used to have a cucumber with every breakfast. Like I would have like bacon eggs and a big cucumber to chomp into. And I love that texture. Like just having the big chomp in the morning. I love that. Um, and you know, the fruits, of course, I mean, last time I was in Mexico, like when I got here first time, like a year ago, that's when I was still sort of experimenting with the stuff. I was meat and fruit. I had so much pineapple, so much mango and watermelon, all these big, juicy, delicious fruits. That's all sugar, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, there's a reason why it tastes so good. And just shifting the mindset to food as a fuel source and not an entertainment source is a big one. And uh, I don't know if you follow Saifedina Moose. He's a, a Bitcoiner and carnivore. He puts it amazingly. He says, he calls it mouth entertainment. Like if you're looking to putting tasty food into your mouth as a source of entertainment, it probably means you need better food and it probably means you need better entertainment because <laughs> there's better ways to find fun than abusing your digestive system and filling it with fructose and chemicals. So yep. breaking that sugar addiction, whether it's from fructose and fruits or just plain refined white sugar can be a big challenge for people because it's so pervasive in the modern diet you think of everything it's just crazy so it's a, it's a real thing breaking that addiction let me tell you i didn't realize but you know again being a vegan the amount of fructose from fruit and then the sweet treats that you tell yourself are okay because they're vegan i ate a ton of those a ton of dark chocolate a ton of sweets that had the cane refined cane sugar or honey in them and again all that stuff is just sweeteners that turns into glucose in your body and metabolize it took me a while to get over that and i noticed the withdrawal symptoms from a high sugar carbohydrate diet and um yeah i often I'm, i just want to just kind of go aside for a second and it's on this topic ben you know i've often wondered because you have dr paul saladino in this space that really promotes and not only him, but also Carnivore Aurelius now with consuming honey and fruit and those type of things. I often wonder, and Dr. Paul, if you watch Ben's podcast, I'm going to ask you today, if you feel that the reason that you added carbohydrates and honey and all these things back in your diet, do you think you might have been oxalate dumping? Because Sally and I think you might have been because you were a vegan prior to doing all this stuff and you went carnivore pretty strictly. And then all these issues like, uh, you know, cramps and stuff at night crept in. And these can be signs of oxalate dumping, Dr. Saladino. I know you've talked to her, but I welcome your thoughts because there's so many of us out here that are thriving without all that stuff. So just wanted to throw that in on, con create some controversy on Ben's podcast. <laughs> Funny enough, I had his right-hand man, Paul Keating, on my podcast, which is a freaking awesome dude. I love that guy. He's like kind of his, his partner in building his brand. And so I've followed that, that, you know, arc of Paul Saladino quite closely. And he was one of the people I first started watching as well, as well as Carnivore Aurelius, like you said. And so I first just want to say, I think they're doing a net good for the world at large by just telling people that meat is good for you. <laughs> I think that that is an important step for many to just take a step in. But I'm very much with you that the, the fruit and honey stuff is like, it's it's off base because he is, how do I say this? I agree with you that the, the problems you were ha he was having were not a carb deficiency. There's no such thing as essential carbohydrates. That was not the problem. I think that because he's been eating so much liver, um, he really pushes beef liver. They both do. And so they eat a lot of liver. So I think that's whacking out their vitamin ratios, like hypervitaminosis, I think it's called. Either that or just Bart K, as I've been following on YouTube, he thinks it was like he just wasn't getting enough protein because he's very active. Um, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that fruit and honey just breaks down to fructose in your body. It's not good for you. So I, it's unfortunate because I think a lot of people just follow those narratives and those, you know, that idea that, oh, like carnivore is good, but, you know, we'll, we'll put a little bit of sugar in there. You got to wonder how much of it is just 
like individuals caving into sugar addiction and just trying to rationalize it in front of a large audience. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I completely agree with you, Ben. And you're, you're absolutely right. Like the greater good and the positive message that Dr. Saladino and carnivore Aurelius are getting out there to just prior to prioritize protein, especially animal protein is great, but it was just a, a thought I was having as we discussed sugar and we discussed oxalate and I'd always wondered. And I, I think to myself, yeah, especially someone that's like myself has come from such a high oxalate toxic background. And Dr. Saladino has shared, he was vegan for quite some time, which is why he, his health was failing him and he wanted to, uh, prioritize the meat and he wrote the carnivore code and talked about, I mean, that's an amazing book. I don't know if you ever read his book, the carnivore code. It was such a great book, but then he, yeah, I've listened to a lot of podcasts of his, uh, yeah, the book, one of the best written books when he first came out as a complete carnivore, and I say complete by not including any um, sort of fruits or honey in that at that time, one of the most in-depth and well-researched books put together on the carnivore and the diet and its benefits. And um, yeah, I just always wondered that because sugar specifically, man, and glucose in any form can be very challenging to break. And I know I'm human. Occasionally, if I go out to eat and there's something sweeter in there and I taste it, my brain lights up like a Christmas tree, man. This stuff just attaches right to it. But I'll tell you one thing. You mentioned the crunch of the cucumber. Yeah, sometimes I miss crunchy stuff because inevitably a lot of our dietary choices now on carnivore is very soft. But, you know, there's things like the carnivore snacks, which kind of give you or the crisps and the carnivore really has his liver chips, but I don't Pork rinds. Of- I have those too. Yeah. Pork rinds, chicharrones. Absolutely. Um, but I can't tell you how much, you know, I crave a steak every evening now. Like literally I'm chomping at the bit, no matter how much I have it. It's like, and, and Dr. Chafee says, it's like his birthday every day. Like I'm sitting here now, like thinking about the huge thick New York strip I got sitting in my fridge for dry brining going, can't wait to stick that sucker on the grill. Oh my Are God. Are you doing one meal a day or more than that? I'm doing two mad. Basically I do. I had been doing three meals a day as a my quest to put weight back on. And I mm-hmm. think I'm getting to a, a spot where I'm good now. So as the listeners heard, I was 127. I'm back up to plus 180 80 in a bit now, which is great for me. I feel great. I'm My strength is up. My, my I just look so much better. And folks later can search my Instagram for my before and after pictures um, at the carnivorist. And um, so I've gone back to a more too mad. And I also found that my digestion is a little better now with having that fast in between. I eat breakfast in the morning really early. It just works for me in terms of my work schedule and recording podcasts. I really get that protein in in the morning. Um, I have two ground beef burger patties, two pastured eggs, a couple of slices of raw cheese, uh, beef bacon, and a, a small glass of kefir every morning. That's my breakfast. And it really sets me up well for the day. The kefir I found invaluable for my gut health. And then later on in the day, I'll have my sort of bigger meaty meal. And I try and incorporate a couple of cuts. And I post pictures on my Instagram. If you want to follow me there every day of what I eat, it's pretty redundant. But as I said, I never get bored. I don't, I know you don't either. Like I crave, I'm again, thinking of it now going, oh yeah. Yeah. And this is another thing worth mentioning for people that are, you know, about to jump into that transition is that. I remember early on, I'm not sure about you, but early on, it was a little bit of a grind getting through those first couple of weeks of only meat. It, it just, I wasn't excited for it yet. I still had a very vivid picture of those delicious carbs, just, just scratching my back for some pasta, some mac and cheese. That was the one that I had a hard time getting rid of. And my friends, for him, it was more like sweet drinks, like soda and like the sugar taste. So everyone has a little bit of different cravings that they really just found a strong neural addiction pathway too. And it is an addiction very much. So don't underplay it. It's you're addicted to this stuff as you know, we all have our addictions in life. It's, it's important to come to terms with that. I definitely um, noticed, I, I would say absolutely after a couple of months, but probably after about that first month, it started getting much easier. And I started really looking forward to that meat every day. And I will say this too, another tip, if someone out there is like, you know, still kind of slogging through those early weeks, I found that when I tried OMAD, which is one meal a day, that really increased my excitement for that meal because you're a little bit hungrier coming up to it and everything sounds good. So I, when I was living in Colombia last year, I got in a routine of just one meal a day, two pounds of ground beef and 
after a couple of weeks of that, every single day, like you said, like clockwork, I was like, oh, I can't wait for this big bowl of meat. And I didn't want anything else. Not, nothing else was even on my mind because it was actually sounded delicious. So basically, that's a good tip to throw in there if anyone's you know having, having trouble getting away from the carbs and sugars, just clawing at your back. That's one way to do it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I also, and a great point, Ben, here is to, for the listeners that are embarking on this journey or just started carnivore for World Carnivore Month last month, is that at the beginning stages, just include a variety of stuff. Don't feel like I, I know I, I prioritize red meat as, as Ben does now, but at the beginning, when I first went carnivore, I would eat the rainbow of carnivore foods, you know, beautiful orange salmon with a crispy salmon skin. I didn't have chicken wings most days because I found I just had a craving for chicken wings. Um, I didn't eat a ton of red meat to begin, as you heard, because it, it was tough for me to digest. But now I just eat red meat twice a day, every day, and huge big steaks. But at the beginning, include these foods in and use dairy if necessary. Again, for me, another point that I didn't make is that if you're oxalate toxic, dairy with the calcium in dairy helps to bind to oxalate if you're dumping in the gut. So that's Sally and Monique. So especially kefir, which is healing to the gut, you know, with the probiotics there for me that had taken antibiotics for many years served a dual purpose. And I, I couldn't tolerate it at first, but now I can drink as much as I like. I have a couple of slices of raw cheddar cheese every morning. It works for me. It doesn't work for everyone. And, um, yeah, and I pri primarily eat red meat now, and I'm sure most people will find that as they go along, like nothing hits quite like a beautiful <laughs> mid rare or rare steak. That's just perfect. And you're a great testament too, just for people who are making that jump all the way from vegan to who think that they could never even think about eating red meat, that it, it can be done. Like you can, it just takes time for you to rewire your brain, just like it did to rewire it to only eat plants. It, those aversion, cause I, I've talked to people who say that it makes them even nauseous to think about red meat cause they've only eaten plants for so long. And that's crazy, but that's just a really deep emotional wiring that you've put through and it's going to take some time to get out of that. But like James said, just start with anything that sounds like a little bit less bad, like even eggs. I've heard people use eggs as their sort of transition, which is perfect. Like that's great. Um, has tons of vitamins and it will definitely create that enlightenment moment that you mentioned where your brain just turns back on after <laughs> years oh, of being shut off. <laughs> that, that day, I mean the profound day of eating that first bite of animal protein after being a vegan for so long was pretty impactful. It can't help but be. But that day when I added red meat back in, even though I couldn't digest it, just that, and you see the videos of the, on Instagram and YouTube of the vegans trying red meat for the first time. And the, I think there's a one with a girl and she starts smiling and going, like, you're like, oh, what have I been doing to myself? Your brain just goes, you fool. What have you been doing? We'd, we've been trying to tell you we wanted this for all this time. And uh, yeah, like I said now, man, it is it is a definite craving and my body going, bring on the nutrition. We're building muscle. We're working for you. Bring it on. And, and that's the best source, honestly. As we talked about from the beginning of the podcast, when you stack up red meat against a lot of these vegan foods i think there's one that's done by uh you know was it? Who, who put it out there um sacred cow their graphics you know beans versus red meat and there's just no wow. comparison in terms of nutrition and again we mm -hmm. highlight bioavailable nutrition stuff that your body can use unbelievable yeah. it's absolutely can't agree more well man we're up in an hour and a half here so let's start wrapping things up i would say oh there was one more thing i wanted to mention i took a note of this early on in the very beginning of your story so kind of a full circle here how your story started with how you were raised this way to believe that fat was bad and that meat was bad and that you were kind of at the very beginning of that arc when that started happening and i was definitely raised that way too my my parents always wanted the absolute best for me. They wanted me to be the healthiest, happiest kid alive. So they did exactly what the government said. And they gave me, you know, cereal and soy milk for breakfast and like a big salad for dinner for my, pretty much my entire young life. <laughs> and so this sort of brings up the topic of how we have to forgive these people in our lives 
whether it's family or friends, or like you said, your uh, girlfriend at the time, who really wanted to do the best for themselves and for us, but they just didn't have the right information. So we have to forgive them, understand where they're coming from, and just do our best to continue learning ourselves and sharing this information in a way that we believe is best for them, which is why you and I both have a podcast now to try to help connect these neurons for people that are so deeply uh, filled with propaganda at this point. And I think that's so important. And I'm sure you've seen that happen both yourself and the people you've interviewed, how it, it's kind of hard when we just look back and we're like, dang, these people I really cared about kind of just took the complete wrong path, either for me or for themselves. How do we deal with the, knowing this and moving forward? Yeah, I, I don't lay the blame at anyone because, as you said, Ben, we're just doing the best we can with the information we have at the time. Thank God for we stand on the shoulders of giants here, Ben, in terms of what we're now understanding to be proper human nutrition. And we've already talked about those heroes in this space extensively on this podcast, but there's so many others. There's so many others. And it just you have to lead by example in this space. And there is no denying things like my before and after pictures, being a vegan versus now being a mostly carnivore. You just can't deny it. The way I feel, the way I, I know how I feel. When we interview others and allows and allow others to from a safe space, because yeah, social media, and if you're in the vicinity of proximity of vegans, when they're being very preachy, can be very overbearing. So things like podcasts, for me, easing back into eating animal foods by listening to people that have experienced this benefit was such a powerful space to find, which is why I started my podcast anyhow, to share those stories, share my own stories like I am with you today, that someone may just press click and play and just listen. And maybe, as I said, their health is failing them. I hope not. This is the reason why we do this, because we don't want people to suffer like we did needlessly. But just understand that maybe what we've been shown prior is not exactly correct. There might be an alternative. And you touched on it earlier that, you know, that rewiring of the brain. Uh, one of the things that I did and I didn't talk about, it, and I'll finish on this note, was I did a, a program from a lady by the name of Annie Hopper, which is the Dynamic Neural Retraining System. And that was before I even found Carnivore. And that is just basically helping your mind to rewire because I knew that I was having such severe allergic reactions to scents. Just no one could light a candle. I would get the brain fog. I couldn't eat certain foods. My body was reacting to everything. But it just speaks to the fact that we need to really rewire our brain and listen for other examples out there and really have empathy for th folks that may not have discovered what we have yet and put ourselves in our shoes when we were just as lacking in knowledge. Absolutely. And it's, I will say it's an extremely exciting journey. It's, it's dark at sometimes realizing how deep these things go, but it's overall just so enlightening and just opens your whole world up. And like I told you before we started recording, I had originally found this from being a Bitcoiner and really being into Bitcoin. A lot of Bitcoin folks dig into health as well. So they found carnivore and a lot of them, there's a lot of, uh, crossing between different rabbit holes that people dig through of just realizing wow there's so many things that we've been told our whole life they're just not right like it's just been hammered onto us and just message to the listeners keep an open mind experiment with yourself listen to your body be honest with it and give carnivore a try for 90 days <laughs> that's a good good way to pretty much wrap it up and man, James Lehman, it's been so awesome talking to you, man. I'm going to fill the description box with your stuff. I know that you have the Carnivorous Chats podcast. You've got the the underscore Carnivorous on Instagram and X or Twitter. Do you have any other places that people should find you, my friend? Ben, what an absolute honor and a privilege today is, man. I, I've done a lot of podcasts. I have, I've done quite a few, um, probably up to around 10 or a dozen now that I've done. And uh, by far, I think this was one of the best and most fun I've had on any podcast. <laughs> this is great chatting with you and thanks for all the great questions. But yeah, basically I'm on Twitter, I'm on X 
at the underscore carnivorist. I'm on Instagram at the underscore carnivorous there. And then on YouTube, which is my, and of course my podcast is on Apple podcasts and Spotify. It's just carnivorous with a T chats, but folks can find me there. I spend quite a bit of time on Insta just because it's quick and easy for me to take pictures, post my <clears> meals, <throat> get my reels out. Um, X is always fun as you and I were talking about, because that's a free open space where we get all the kind of the vegan hate coming towards me and arguing with folks, but uh, always a good, uh, good time on X. But yeah, man, this was great. I hope that um, I can welcome you to my podcast to share your own story one day, my friend. Absolutely. I would love that. And to anyone listening whose brains are in a flurry right now of thoughts and wondering what to do next, perhaps you find yourself in somewhat similar situation to James has, has been in, go start an episode of one of his podcasts and just grind your way through it. That is the best way that I've found. Like I said, I did it with Anthony Chafee's people here who resonate with that story. Just go start listening. For, turn the TV off, please. Stop watching Netflix documentaries. <laughs> they are, do not want them what's best for you. They want what's best for their shareholders and their big money, pharma, big food behind the scenes. Listen to real people telling real stories. I really think that is the bedrock. Oh, great book he's holding up. He's holding up Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind by Dr. Georgia Ede. She is amazing. And, and I say that to say, and sorry to interrupt you, uh, Ben, but not only get off Netflix and all that garbage, the television, the tell I vision read a book and read a book from one of these people from one of these doctors, like just read a book and then listen, as Ben was saying to podcasts, binge on them, listen to folks experience and listen to the experts in the area. Great advice and start. Sorry to interrupt you, Ben. No, no problem. I know you're a big walker too. I also love my walks. Combining walking and podcasting is a life changer. It sounds so simple, but just throwing on the headphones, queuing up some episodes downloaded, and just the simple movement of just getting light exercise, getting your blood flowing, it really charges up your brain in such a way that you absorb the information so much better. So combining those two things together is just going to upgrade your consciousness to a crazy high level. It, there's too many people out there still just sitting home and watch YouTube and listen to podcasts there. Get out there. Go, go walk around the neighborhood. Go adventure because you're, you're going to get more out of it, really. I completely agree. Stack those positive habits. We didn't get it in today. We can get into it uh, later on, but absolutely. I love walking, listening to podcasts at the same time. That means I'm in nature. I'm moving my body. I'm getting new information. My brain's working. My body's working. I, I get up in the morning. I ground. I look at the sunrise, get sun on my skin. Stack those positive habits, Ben. This is, yes. this, no, this is the secret to life and eat plenty of red meat. That's how I'm going to end the podcast. Thank you, brother. Amen. It's been <laughs> awesome, James. Have a good one, man. We'll be in touch. Thank you, sir. Thanks again. Peace.